Hello everybody, welcome to the Marketing 320 Final Exam Review. Today we are going to go over chapters 1, 5, 8, 9, 11, 12, 15, and 19. We have been given a lot of chapters for this final, but we're going to have some fun. Two quick disclaimers, I'm no ma marketing mastermind, so study on your own too. This is just um, to help us remember the terms. And two, there are going to be some real cringy memes in here, but bear with me, they'll help us remember. Let's get into it. Chapter 1 is an overview of marketing. Chapter 1 is actually the only chapter included on here that our teacher did not directly say would be in the final, but it kind of lays the foundation, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have questions from it, so I just am going to go over it real quick just to make sure. So, term number 1, marketing. This is creating, capturing, communicating, and delivering value to customers. And we're going to go over like the difference between advertising and marketing later. So goods. Goods are items that can be physically touched. I think of like when I'm playing the anything guessing game, when I say like, is it tangible? Tangible. That would be a good. Ideas. So these are intellectual concepts, um, thoughts, opinions, philosophies. I put this backpack here because our class, we had to like come up with an idea, like a marketing idea. And um, my group was like, what if we did a um, a backpack, but you didn't have to carry it. It would just kind of go beside you. And then at the end, we were like, <laughs> it already exists. It, that idea has been done. It's a rolly backpack, but that's an idea, a concept. A business-to-business -business marketing, so B2B. This is the process of purchasing and selling items that will either be used to make other things or resold to other businesses. So unlike a business-to-consumer, where the business buys the products and then sells it to a consumer, Business to business is where like um, either the producer will sell it to like this movie is called Chef. One of th I love this movie, and basically he one of the tips that he's showing his son to do um, to be a chef later is that you have to get to the market right at um, the crack of dawn when they open so that you get the best produce. So this is a business to business because um, this business like the produce is selling to another business, the restaurant. Business to consumer, so this is the process in which businesses sell to consumers. So, <laughs> I thought this meme was funny. Clubbing in your 20s versus clubbing in your 40s. So Costco and Sam's are examples of business to business, which I kind of remember because they, they're so tricky. It would be business, I mean business to consumer, it would be business to business, like normally wholesale is, but um, they kind of trick the wholesale laws and say if you have a card, you are technically like um, you can buy as a consumer. Uh, this is some weird loophole, so you can buy in bulk. That's why you need like a card to get into Costco and Sam's. But I just thought this meme was funny too. Okay, consumer to consumer. So this is the process in which consumers sell to other consumers. So um, garage sales or trade and barter stuff like that. Consumer relation, <laughs> customer relationship management. So this is a business philosophy. Um, that focuses on the customer and building loyalty. So <laughs> I thought this meme was so funny. When someone says customer service is easy, and I took that personally. Like customer relationship management seems so difficult because the customers can have like years of good experiences and there's one bad thing and it's like, I'm never coming back again. And it's like, oh, that loyalty that we built up and invested so much in. But that's CRM. And you also might know it from like a CRM database, like... Um, like kind of relational customer relationship management database. An exchange. So this is the trade of things of value between the buyer and the seller. I remember when I used to play Webkins as a kid, um, you could always go to the gem shop and you could have like, you can exchange with, um, I forgot his name, this dog and you could like trade. It was so fun. But exchange, um, basically giving something of value to get something of value. The four P's of marketing. This is important. This is a big one. You have product, price, promotion, and place. So I use the hydro flask as an example. The product is the hydro flask. So uh, what material is it made of? What purpose does it serve? You know, is the straw bendy? How tall is it? Does it fit in your hand well? And then the price, it is 45 US dollars. It's pricey, but the people who have it love it. So I can't, I can't be a hater. Promote, promotion, so this is advertising. So for example, Adele, um, 
I, th- I don't know whether she was seen with it or she like got sponsored to hold it, but that was um, one business promotion, like a way of advertising. Well then, place. <laughs> this video was so funny. It was like people fighting, like full on fighting in a Target for like Valentine's Day Stanley Cups. So the place is important. They, I think Hydro Flask um, does like sourced rarity, meaning like they, certain colors, they're limited edition. So like, and only in certain places. So it's like, it makes you like, oh, I got to get it or else I'm not going to get it again. But those are the four P's of marketing. This is probably the most important slide of this whole thing. So get it extra in your brain juices. (laughs) Okay, marketing channel management or supply chain management. This is a set of approaches and techniques firms employ to um, efficiently gather supplies. So the ultimate marketing channel management like masters are Alibaba. This is like a website online and it's a Chinese company that just makes supplies so cheap and so easily available. Oh my goodness. I don't know. The labor they use is definitely not ethical, but it is so fast to get supplies and a lot of people, um, a lot of businesses resell or get uh, materials from them. So the marketing mix or the four P's, um, the marketing mix is the combination, and I think I have another slide on this that goes more in depth and maybe even have a, has a meme. So you all, all you need to know is it's basically a mix of the four Ps, um, the controllable set of acti- activities that a firm uses to respond to the wants of its target customers. So um, what kind of product does, um, how, what do we have to change in our product, like that mix? okay, does the price need to be adjusted? Um, Maybe we need more placement here and less placement here. How are we going to promote it? That's the marketing mix. So marketing plan. This is a written document composed of uh, basically the current marketing situation and what we're going to do in the future. (laughs) No one can steal your marketing plan if you don't have a marketing plan. That's pretty funny. Sometimes I guess businesses just, I guess some get lucky and don't have a super strategic plan but I would guess that most businesses who have like a um, goals and ways that they're gonna get there in a, a tight budget I would guess they would do better relational orientation so this is a method of building relationships um, with customers based on the philosophy that buyers and sellers should develop a long-term relationship so the ultimate example of this I think of is like a personal trainer like Yes, you can go to any personal trainer and get training. You can get an app or see websites online, but it's about that relationship where um, if you know someone's going to motivate you and you have that like that link in your head where it's like I do what they say and and I know they're competent and I know they want the best for me and they also they know what they're doing and they practice what they preach. That like relationship is going to um, keep the buyer, the customer coming back to that trainer and uh, be long term service so this is any intangible offering that involves a deed performance or effort that cannot be physically opposed (laughs) i mean um, possessed so um one example of a service is like uber eats or postmates i thought this meme was so funny (laughs) hi this is your uber eats driver are you outside (laughs) sorry i just got hit by an suv on a lime scooter i'm waiting for the ambulance obviously not funny he got hit that's terrible i just the lime scooter if i got this text i'd be like what is even happening right now but um uber eats is an example of a service i i do not know if that's real but that's wild okay supply chain management this is about um efficiently um concerning how products are made shipped and sold the ultimate example of this is amazon like their supply chain management, y'all, is wild. I don't know how they do, like, day of shipping, but it's crazy. Like, they they just got that down. Sometimes even the price is just, like, better on another website, but it's just, like, the supply chain management is so good. Like, it's just the right... Uh, it just ensures that the it reaches the customer at the right time, and it's and nothing really comes damaged for me, at least. It's great. So value, value reflects the relationship of benefits to costs or what the consumer gets. Um, it puts the Xbox in my cart or it gets the pepper spray. <laughs> oh, 
Well, I don't remember what this meme was. Uh, maybe it was a Black Friday one, but obviously she wants um, the Xbox because it has um, value that she wants. So <laughs> that meme is funny. Okay, value co-creation. So this is uh, customers act as collaborators with a retailer to produce a product. So basically, I like to like break down the etymology like co, like cohabitation, like two people together, like co meaning together and then creation to bring something into existence so you bring into something uh bring something into existence together <laughs> hey girl want to go to color me mine with me so color me mine is like i love that as a kid you basically are go to an art store and you buy like a mug maybe like for mother's day but you get to paint it and then they furnace it and then you can give it as a gift so this is value co-creation that mug is now um going to be valuable to your mom because you've created something with this company. Customer excellence. This involves a focus on retaining loyal customers and excellent customer service. A couple of these terms are similar in that it's all about relationships, um, but this is just another, another term for that, I would say. Diversification strategy. So this is a growth strategy where a firm introduces a new product or service um, that doesn't currently exist or isn't in that market. So uh, an example that I thought of was wigs for dogs. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure they exist, but I'm sure like one of the first things created for pets was not wigs, but once <laughs> someone was like, crazy dog lovers will buy it. So this is a diversification strategy, like taken to the highest extreme, very diverse. Okay, locational excellence. This is a method of achieving excellence by having a strong physical location or internet presence. So I think one example of a company that does this well is Bucky's, because Bucky's, when you need to stop, they're like right off the highway, perfect placement every time. You can just walk in, use the restroom, um, go get that cookie dough, you know, just shop around. And I thought this was so funny. Take her somewhere special. I would love to go, go to Bucky's. Um, right now, I wish it was closer to me. Anyhow, but they master locational excellence. Chapter five. Okay, that wasn't too long. Now we're getting into the real stuff. Analyzing the marketing environment. So the first term is artificial intelligence. This is solutions that reply, uh, rely on computer systems to perform tasks that require human intelligent, intel, intelligence. The only way to keep... AI from taking your job is to use AI to do your job better. Wow, that was beautiful. Um, but you all know artificial intelligence like ChatGPT, uh, basically harnessing technology um, to do tasks that humans would normally do. Country culture. So this is similar to culture, but it's at a country as a whole. So it could be like symbols, colors, and the way people dress, you know, the foods people eat. So I just thought this was a funny one. When you visit America, and then you have stuff like in our culture, like we like football games and like um, hamburgers. And then when America visits you, it's like bald eagle coming at you, like powerful. I don't know. I won't. <laughs> I'm killing all these memes by explaining them, but it's helping us remember. So moving on. Um, food deserts. This is areas where consumers have no access to healthy, affordable, fresh food options. Um, probably more impoverished areas where um, it's difficult because it's like what comes first the chicken or the egg if you know there were to be healthy options a lot of people don't have money to buy them but if people don't have money to buy them there's not going to be healthy food options it's it's a difficult um, a difficult place so now we're going to go through the generations and this has to do with like um, market segmentation so a lot of markets will segment and target demographics based on age. So this is just some generations, I believe four. So we have the baby boomers. So this is a people born after World War II. <laughs> How do you feel, fellow boomers? Um, generation X, this is a cohort, cohort of people born between 1965 and 1980. And so you have the boomers, generation X, and then millennials. And there's ways to make fun of every generation, but um, typically baby boomers do not like millennials, and then Generation X is just in the middle. I think 
baby boomers, like, since they're after the war, they're used to, like, perseverance and working hard in the tough situations, and they kind of see maybe um, Generation Y or millennials as, you know, technology-heavy, um, maybe a little spoiled. Um, but uh, millennials is... It's difficult being a millennial, I would imagine, like, to buy a home or, like, they say a lot of millennials are, like, not having kids and not getting married just because stuff is so expensive. So I thought this meme was funny. Someone, you will always be single and die alone in your own apartment. Me. My own apartment? (laughs) Or, like, millennials, my own apartment. (laughs) Just because cost of living is so high. Generation Z, this is mine. So this is born between, people born between 1997 and 2009 known as digital natives because we have not lived in a time without technology. (laughs) And it has led to some of the funniest memes ever that are just too chaotic. Generation Alpha. So this is people born between 2010 and 2025. It's crazy. People will be born next year and be part of this generation. But this meme is like, Generation Z, you're so addicted to technology, but Generation Alpha, like, it's even more. Like, you got those iPad kids and, like, babies with phones. It's crazy. It's brutal out here. It's wild. So a generational cohort is a group of people of the same generation um, that have similar purchase behaviors because they are in that generation. So (laughs) me and my friends like to go to Goodwill, which I think is kind of a little bit, like, thrifting might... It kind of seems like a Gen Z activity. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know a lot of people from my generation like to do it, but the cohort is uh, basically the group in that generation that likes to do similar activities. Green marketing. So moving on to kind of a, um, types of marketing. So this is a strategic effort by firms to supply customers with environmentally friendly merchandise. So this is important to note that this is genuine. This is not like greenwashing. Uh, which we'll talk about in a sec. Green marketing is like actually caring about the environment and providing customers with products that are sustainable. So Patagonia is a brand that does this well. While green washing is basically exploiting um, customers by making them think that marketing is um, environmentally friendly when it's not. So I thought this meme was funny. Changing a green logo. Um, <laughs> divesting. I actually don't know what that means. I think it means producing fossil fuels, and they're the same picture. Okay, inflation. This refers to the persistent increase in the prices of goods and services. So basically, parents are going to have to give their kids a lot more money. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. Um, The tooth fairy is going to have to give kids a lot more money uh, when they lose teeth. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Because it, like a dollar back in the day, could buy, I don't know, a nice maybe little ring or bouncy ball toy, but now you need like 10 bucks to buy any good toy a kid would want, so that's inflation. Interest rates, so this is the cost of borrowing money or the cost of the consumer, uh, to the consumer that the bank charges, so basically when you want to borrow money, maybe for a house, they're not just going to let you borrow that money for free because why would they do that besides like being nice? They're going to say, okay, you have to pay us back a little extra. So that's interest rate. Okay, Internet of Things. This is a lot of reading, but this is a a fun term. This is when multiple smart devices um, with Internet sensors share data so that you can basically have the most efficient um, energy maximization, I would say. So this is like a fridge and a coffee maker um, could optimize their energy by like, okay, if we need to make coffee and boil water, which takes a lot of energy, the fridge can just stay closed and um, not be actively cooling. Chapter 8. This is an overview of marketing. So, (laughs) bottom of the pyramid. This is a term used for economic settings in which consumers earn very low wages. So, if you remember, Abby Lee Miller, she had her pyramid, and if you were at the bottom of the pyramid, you would get low wages or low souls. You wouldn't get a lot of rewards, so I remember it like that. Okay, direct investment. This is when a firm maintains 100% ownership of um, the facility that it's opening overseas. And so basically, you could, if you are opening like a plant, for example, across seas, 
you could have foreign managers manage it. You can have um, maybe the country get half the profit for letting you, but direct investment is where basically you get all the all of the profit. Okay, exchange rate. This is the measure of how much one currency is worth in relationship to another. So <laughs> I think uh, when the cashier accidentally gives you back a Canadian quarter, because can Canadian dollars, I believe, are slight, worth slightly more than U.S. dollars. Um, but that's exchange rate, and that's Mr. Worldwide. Okay, a franchisee and a franchisor. This might have two E's. Apologies. Ah, that kind of rhymed. Okay, so a franchisee is a business model. Okay, I did do this wrong. A franchise is the business model where a franchisee operates the business and the franchise using the system of the franchisor. So let's just say um, my friend owns the franchise of McDonald's, which they would be very rich if they did. Um, if I'm like, hey, friend, can I open up a McDonald's um, here where I am? I would be the franchisee, she would be the franchisor, and McDonald's would be the franchise. Okay, gross domestic product, or GDP. So this is defi <laughs> defined as the market value of goods and services produced by a country in a year. So it's often measured by quarters, so <laughs> I just thought this meme was funny. Basically the goods and services um, the country outputs in a year. Okay. Gross national income. So this is different. So this is the GDP plus the net income earned from investments abroad. So like we just talked about, those foreign direct investments, that would be counted into the gross national income, but not the GDP. A joint venture. So this is formed when a firm entering a new market pools its resources with those of local firms to form a new company in which ownership, control, and profits are shared. So basically, you're sharing the costs and risks with local partners in a joint venture. And there are a lot of these on Shark Tank, which is, I love that show. Okay, purchasing power parity. So this is a theory that states that if the exchange rates of two countries are in equilibrium, the product purchased in one will cost the same in the other. This might seem so obvious, but it's basically saying um, if, that, if one currency is worth the same in, one, in another, like we just talked about, that product is going to cost the same in both countries. Okay, a tariff. So this is a tax levied on a good imported into another country, also called a, du a duty. One example of this is in Louisiana, we get some crawfish imported from China, cr frozen crawfish. But I believe the state or the local government imposes tariffs, which tax um, the crawfish, which make it about the same price as local crawfish. That way it will not drive local crawfish owners out of business. And a quota is similar in that it protects, uh, protects local farmers, but instead of saying, um, okay, it's gonna cost extra, they just say, you can sell it at whatever price you want, but you can only sell this much. So they kind of achieve the same purpose of limiting the amount that other countries will bring in goods. Okay, trade deficit. So this results when a country imports more goods than it exports. Basically, um, when you are bringing in more than you are producing. And then a surplus is when there's a higher level of exports. So the trade surplus, you would be exporting more than you're importing. Does that mean too much stuff? Ex Okay, too much stuff in the other countries. You would, this meme is a little off. It should actually be switched. Um, you would have too little stuff because you'd be putting, like, trading or giving away more than you're bringing in. Okay, a trading block. This consists of those countries that have signed a particular trade agreement. <laughs> One simp does simply not uh, form a trade block with North Korea. Okay, chapter nine. Great. Behavioral segmentation. So this is... The idea, segmentation is basically dividing the market um, to target a specific audience. So behavioral segmentation means segmenting the market into um, groups based on how they behave or interact with the service. So I think of the example of Vaseline, because Vaseline is just used for so many purposes. So you might have one um, target market that is like, okay, I use Vaseline um, for my lips. And then another one is like, okay, I use it for... 
um, my dry spots on my ankles, like those would be different, um, different ways of behaving or interacting with this product. Benefit segmentation. So this is um, grouping of customers on the basis of the benefits they derive from the product, but they use the product the same way. So this was so funny. I went to um, CypherCon with my boyfriend this year, and we went to um, a talk about furries, and it was so, so interesting. Basically, um, the furry community, since they are wearing these like big um, masks and outfits or personas, if you will, it's it gets pretty hot and heavy. So they needed like um, cooling. So they invented this cooling vest. Uh, then the military, the U.S. military, picked it up and started using it for them for them too. And so benefit segmentation. Um, <laughs> these would be in the same group because they both. Um, even though they're using it for different things, they benefit in the same way in that they are less hot under um, heavy uniform or gear. I thought that was so interesting. Okay, concentrated targeting strategy. This is a marketing strategy of selecting a single target market and focusing all energy on them. So this is basically um, another way of saying a niche. Concentrated targeting is like finding a really niche group so for this, I remember this product came out and I was so excited. It was this um, soccer ball where you could kick it and it could tell you exactly um, how you kick the ball, where on your foot, the top spin you got. And then if you're like, okay, I want it to curve to the left more next time, it would tell you what angle you need to come at instead. And so that was um, specifically targeted for soccer players who wanted to improve their free kicks. So that would be a very concentrated um, targeting strategy. Differentiated targeting strategy. This is a strategy through which a firm targets several market segments, offering um, each per each segment a different service or goods. So I think of Starbucks. It has lots of different options. You can go in. You can if you're hungry, that's one um, segment like Target. If you're thirsty, if you need caffeine, if you need like a sleep relaxing drink, if you just want to buy a gift card for someone you love or um, a reusable mug it's um, they offer many different um, products services demographic segmentation this is the grouping of consumers according to easily measured objective characteristics such as age gender income or education so demographic um, for Barbie is normally like um, elementary school girls that would be um, a grouping for this. Geographic segmentation. This is based on um, not your demography, of course, but your geography. So the etymology of that word is what um, lends itself to these two terms. So it would basically say, OK, we're going to market, I don't know, surfboards to California. That's the most stereotype example I've ever said. Um, but basically would be dividing up based on where you live. And this is interesting. Geodemographic, this combines both our terms that we just did. This is grouping of um, consumers on the basis of both um, their geography and their demographics. So let's just say you're marketing some products to um, Floridians. You, can, you do this both because they're in Florida and because of their, um, the type of, I guess, lifestyle of Floridians. So what's a Florida-specific product? Maybe like... Um, alligator repellent spray. I don't know if that's a thing or if I just invented an awesome new product, but that would be like uh, geodemographic segmentation. Loyalty segmentation. So this is a strategy of investing in loyalty initiatives to retain the firm's most profitable customers. So this is basically segmenting your market and targeting specifically the same customers over and over. Old Navy does this so well. Oh my gosh, you go into the store, and they play a couple songs. Every maybe fourth or fifth song you heard, welcome, Navius Rewards. Um, like what you're finding? Check out our new rewards program. Literally, it, like, it brainwashes you if you're in that store too long. It's crazy. But they have a good rewards program. It's like 20% cash back and 15% discount or something like that. It's wild. Market basket analysis. Market basket. Uh, this is a mathematical modeling technique that utilizes millions, 
that's a tongue twister, millions of customer purchases to determine an association between a group of items that customers purchased at the same time. This is a mouthful, but basically if you think of it like a market basket, um, this is basically um, just looking at data that says, okay, what do customers put in their basket at the same time? Is there any correlation? Let's just say someone buys spaghetti. Are they buying red sauce too? Or are they buying like um, hamburger buns? Probably the red sauce. So then you could mark it based on that. Um, Amazon does this when they say, based on your recommendations, we think you'd like this. So like if you buy a Kindle, it might recommend like a Kindle cover or a pen. <laughs> Occasion segmentation. So this is a type of behavioral segmentation based on whether a product or when, this word is important, when a product or service is purchased or consumed. So the ultimate be occasion segmentation would be like wedding stores. That is a specific um, occasion that is targeted just for when you're married, usually. Okay, micro-marketing. So this is an extreme form of segmentation that tailors a product or service to suit an individual's customer's wants also known as one-to-one -one marketing. So, <laughs> I don't always commission artwork, but when I do, I tip for <laughs> great works of art. Um, this is, micro-marketing is like, I think of it as art commissions because it's literally like one-on-one. -on -one. You say, okay, I would like this, and then they do it for you. So this is micro-marketing to the, to the, as low as, as micro as you can go. Value, I love these memes, <laughs> so funny. This reflects the val the relationship of the benefit to cost, basically what the consumer gets for what he gives or she gives. Trade offer <laughs> at GameStop. You receive $4, I receive Xbox 365. Or your gorgeous selfie for my reaction. <laughs> or your cat for some chocolate milk. Fair deal. Exchanges of value. So a value proposition is basically your offer, um, what you're saying, um, what you're proposing is better than um, what other people are trying to sell. Chapter 11. I think we're about halfway through. That's great. What luck. Okay, actual product. This is the physical attributes of a product, including the brand name, features, and quality that make the product. So I think of Lululemon as like very high um, in the actual product. They have their branding on everything because people know it's high quality. Um, they have like specific features that make at least a women's active wear very um, easy to use, very, I don't know the word for it. Everything is just designed with a purpose, which is cool. Like there's pockets on the back and the side. It's good stuff. I like Lululemon, but it's too expensive, but moving on. Okay, associated services. This is also known as augmented product. So you can think of augmented reality as like when basically um, you are seeing something that's not there. So this is a non-physical attribute of the product. So this is like a warranty or a product service. So what is the product doing? Or um, like financing, after sales service, stuff like this. Brand association. So this is the mental link that customers have between a brand and its key product attributes. So back to Lululemon. Brand association is what keeps Lululemon in business. You have the exact same stuff on Amazon, but people associate Lululemon with high quality. Um, they have a lifetime warranty for all their clothes. It's kind of like um, the trendy brand, I guess. So brand association is very, very important in marketing. Brand awareness, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, this measures how many customers in a market are familiar with the brand. So even if your brand's the best, if you have no brand awareness, then it's um, it does no good. Even if you have brand association with only a couple customers, that won't really get you anywhere without brand awareness. Okay, brand dilution. 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 I think I'm saying that right. Um, this occurs when a brand's um, extension adversely affects consumer perceptions. This is basically like, if you try to market, you got to know your audience. Uh, read the room. You gotta. <laughs> what am I talking about? I never marketed anything, and I'm talking like an expert. But, or like I know what I'm doing. You gotta read the room. <laughs> um, basically, it's saying that brands. You gotta know who your who your customers are. If Lululemon advertises 
um, to everyone and says, this is accessible to everyone, it's spreading yourself too thin and you're also not having, like, um, there's nothing distinguishing or rare about everyone who would wear Lulu if it's, like, spread across everywhere, if that makes sense. Uh, brand extension. This is the use of the same brand name for new products. So, like, Subway, they are a sandwich company, but they extended their brand to um, desserts now. They're doing footlong churros, cookies, um, I think pretzels, too. This is an example of brand extension. Okay, brand licensing. This is a contractual agreement between firms where one firm allows another to use its brand uh, name, logo, logo, or symbols. So, an example of this, Barbie... Um, let, I don't think that's the company name, Mattel, I believe, let this uh, onesie and sleepwear company use their branding. A win-win, if you will. So brand repositioning repos or rebranding. This is where marketers change a brand's focus to target a new market, um, basically kind of pivot. I love this meme. Me having meetings with myself to discuss my rebrand. Um, an example of this would be like Facebook changing um it's named to Meta, which I wasn't really sure what that was for, but I think it got people's attention, so call it what you will. All right. Cannibalize. So this is basically a form, um, from a marketing perspective, it's the negative impact on a firm's sales or profits when one company competes closely with a similar product created by the same company. So an example of this that I think of is like Old Navy and Gap. They're both owned by the same company, but if they both were to like open stores right next to each other, it would just cannibalize them because they would be competing for the same um, same customers. Okay, co-branding. This is the practice of marketing two or more brands together on the same package. So um, a Klondike bar and a Reese's on the same. That sounds like a killer combo, I'm not gonna lie. This is called co-branding. Core customer value. So this is, um, the basic problem solving benefits that consumers are seeking. So when I think of like purchases, um, I believe, I think every purchase is trying to solve a problem. And so this is the core customer value, like what value, what problem is it solving? And you might be thinking like, okay, some purchases are just for fun. Well, I guess one could say like, if you're purchasing something for fun, it's solving the problem of not having fun. So every purchase has, has a point. It'd be interesting to think like, oh, does some purchases not have a point? Um, I'll think about that just for fun. Okay, breadth. So this is the number of product lines offered by a firm. So it goes along with this term, um, depth. So breadth is kind of like um, widely across like, okay, Coke, we're having uh, one line where it's um, flavored like fruit, one line where it's normal Coke, one it's old school, one where it's diet. And then the depth would be like, the number of categories within a product line. So for example, the diet one, how many different kinds of diet Coke do we have? We have a caffeine, caffeine, caffeine free one, um, a normal one, um, Coke Zero, stuff like that. Okay, primary package. So this is the packaging the consumer uses. So it's like a toothpaste tube. <laughs> I thought that meme was funny. And then the secondary packaging is like the exterior that contains the toothpaste tube. Uh, we are so wasteful uh, when uh, producing the human race. Like, we really only need that primary package. But at the same time, I do like like getting like chapstick and chapstick. Like, if they were just selling the chapstick, it'd be weird. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes you need the packaging outside just for sanitary reasons, even. Okay, private label brands. So this is a brand developed, um, brand developed and marketing, and brand developed and marketed. <laughs> by a real retailer and available only from that retailer. Sorry, that was rough. Uh, I'll see myself out now. <laughs> this is basically um, a store brand. So when you can only get a product from a specific store because they have um, a private label brand. So for example, Trader Joe's, Joe's O's. I always tell my mom, I'm like, Joe's O's is so much better than Cheerios. We have Cheerios at home. No, it's not the same. It's the Trader Joe's. It's the store brand private label brand. It's private because Kroger or Ralph's couldn't just sell um, Joe's O's because it's Trader Joe's. Okay, convenience products and services. So this is products or services for which the consumer is not willing to spend any effort to evaluate 
um, prior to their purchase. So this is basically an impulse buy. So they'll put this by like the checkout. So you just grab it really fast. Okay. Shopping products. So, so this is products where you will shop around a little. You'll con compare alternatives. It's not just an impulse buy. And then specialty products are products where you'll, you'll take an extended amount of time to consider the product that you're buying. So for example, glasses, since they're expensive and um, you'll have them for a long time, they're a specialty product because you'll take a lot of time to um, examine your different options. And unsought products are basically products no one asked for. So you don't think about it. You don't buy it on impulse. It's just like when you, someone buys it, but it's not, it's very rare and no one's asking. <laughs> Chapter 12, great. <laughs> can't believe I put this, what is this? Oh, it's because he's the alpha. <laughs> okay, alpha testing. This is an attempt by the firm to determine whether a product will perform according to its design. Oh, so this is like, this wolf is alone. He's the lone wolf and the alpha because um, in alpha testing, it's like, it, it's just the firm. You haven't put it to customers. It's the product against itself alone. Like, will this succeed? And then when it goes to beta testing, this is like having potential customers examine the product. So it goes to others. Beta testing is going pretty well. So I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious. Like, if the consumers are liking it, then that's a good sign. Brainstorming. So this is a group activity used to generate ideas. And a concept is often... Um, brought forth in brainstorming. And this is a brief written description of a product or service. So you don't typically have like a product idea right away. You have a concept and then the concept gets developed into a product idea. Concept testing. So this is a process in which the concept, concept statement um, is presented to potential buyers to obtain the reactions. And I was so jealous. My friend as a kid, she always got into the concept testing groups like her parents would, um, she would, they would just put her in it and she would make money by like um, giving her opinions and doing surveys on potential products. And I was like, that would be so fun. I would love that. I never got into it though. I think my parents thought it was a scam, which maybe it was. Okay, we're gonna go through the four stages of product life cycle now. So first we have the introduction stage. This is the stage of the product um, life cycle when innovators start buying the product. Excuse me. And then the growth stage is where um, the product gains acceptance and sales increase. Then maturity is basically when sales reach their peak. Um, and then firms start to add new products or new features and they have to kind of start rein reinventing um, the product so that it doesn't go to the decline stage where sales decline and then the product eventually um, is no longer made and goes out of market. Okay, diffusion of innovation. This is a process by which the use of an innovation spreads throughout a market group over time. So this is, you know how a diffuser, like it sprays into the air and um, the scent kind of goes everywhere? This is kind of um, when an innovation kind of goes everywhere. And I thought this was so funny, consumer. Uh, you never really, well, I guess the whole part of point of marketing is to know this. But sometimes it, it'll, it'll surprise you, you know, what causes this diffusion of innovation. Um, one person wearing gym shark or um, a billion of, or $250,000 billboard for gym shark. Like the fusion of innovation or the spreading of an idea can come from many ways, but seeing other people wear it is, is a, definitely a good one. First movers, so this is product pioneers that are the first to create a market. And so I thought it was early ad adopters, but the first movers are even before this. Um, and they're um, just, of course, the first people to actually create a market. So they actually like create the need for something. And then the early adopters are the ones who um, say, oh, this is a need that I have. Let me um, buy this product. And then uh, the, la the laggards are the consumers who avoid, I think I said that right, avoid change and stick to traditional products until they can't find them anymore. So I thought this meme was funny. 
I wear a mask for your protection. And then the laggards have like this 100 year old mask because they don't want to buy a new one. It's, um, I totally get that. I'm like that with a couple of things. Like I'm just not buying a new one. This one is good and I don't want to, uh, I'm stubborn in that sometimes. Okay, outsourcing. This is basically where um, a business or a client will hire um, outside help to um, do some kind of aspect of business. So there's a lot of outsourcing of like phone calls, so like teleprompters to um, other countries and um, a lot of more, what do you call it, virtual jobs are becoming outsourced now with Zoom post pandemic. Ah, I love, I love Step Brothers. That movie is so funny. This is basically, R&D means research and development. This is groups of firms and institutions um, that collaborate to explore new ideas. So the, um, this is basically when companies get together to do research and development to say, okay, what new products could we introduce to the market? Reverse engineering. So this is taking apart a product, analyzing it, and creating an improved product that does not um, that does not infringe on the comp on whatever you took apart that patent. So this is so tricky. This is basically saying like, I'm gonna copy your product by taking it apart, learning everything that there is to know about it, and making it even better. Which is like you sly dog. But I guess that's how um, products get better. It would be the best thing you can do as a company is reverse engineer your own product. I like this meme though. This was supposed to be a Prius. Test marketing. So this is a method of determining the success of a potential new product. So when you get a successful um, test market run, it I assume it'd be so exciting. Chapter 15. No way. Two more chapters. We have done 100 terms so far, and it's only been like 40 minutes. This is, we're ahead of schedule, gang. Okay. Advertising allowance. So this is the tactic of offering a price reduction to channel members if they agree to feature the manufacturer's product in their advertising. It's so funny. There's so many Dollar Shave Club advertisements on YouTube. So an example of advertising allowance would be um, if YouTube was like, you can be on our um, YouTube page if you give us a discount for your razors, which I think probably um, Dollar Shave Club I'm, I'm sure YouTube is not getting just hundreds of razors for free, but it's funny to imagine. Bait and switch. So this is um, a deceptive practice of luring people into your store with a very seemingly low deal, the bait, and then the switch is aggressively pressuring someone to buy either something that's more expensive because it's good quality or because maybe you go into a shoe store and you're like, 20% off the style, but there's only one size, and it's like a kid's size three, so they're like, oh, you got to buy something else. That's the switch. Very, very tricky. It's tricky, tricky. Uh, cash discount. This is the tactic of offering a reduction in the invoice cost if the buyer pays the invoice prior to the end of the discount period. So you might be thinking, what does that even mean? What is the point? This is the opposite of interest, like charging interest. So... Interest is basically like like we talked about, where you have to pay an amount because you're paying back the bank like later. But a cash discount is when you like pay a business earlier, so then they give you a little discount. And you might be thinking, okay, why would they even do that? Because they'd be receiving less money or the same, or what's the point? I remember in, in accounting, it was super interesting just the way that they write off like debits and credits and like, the timing where the money comes in is very important. So this is one motivation for task discount. I would love to learn more about that. Co <laughs> Gosh, competition-based pricing method. So this is an approach, I have a story time, that's why I laugh, that attempts to reflect how the firm wants consumers to interpret its product relative to the competitor's offering. So an example of this would be setting a price close to a competitor's price to, cons to signal that the product is similar. So I really messed up when I tried to, where I, when I didn't do this enough. Basically, um, when I was, when I was a young lass, I wanted to like be a little bit of a businesswoman, and so I tie-dyed. I got a bunch of like men's tank tops from Dollar General, like those packs for like three, and then I tie-dyed them all 
cropped them, shrunk them in the wash. And I was like, oh, this is so sick. I have these tie-dye shirts. They're so cute. And I was like, okay, so each of these only cost me like 30 cents or 33 cents or whatever, so plus the tie-dye, 50 cents, let's just say, to be exact. If I sell them for $4 each, that's a crazy profit margin. I can do that. But what I didn't come to realize was that doing that signaled to the um, consumers that my shirt was probably a lot less high quality. So competition-based pricing method is basically saying you need to look at your competitors and and you don't want to just consider your cost to profit um, pricing method. You have to see like how much is other people selling this stuff for. It was a fail. I sold not one tank top. Actually, I brought it out on the stand um, in this mall, and the wind blew it over, and it blew into the s- blew into the streets. It was so embarrassing, but it was it was a good experience, and it's it's good to be embarrassed sometimes. So I was it was fun. Okay, cost based pricing method. This is what we just talked about. Cost based pricing is basically where you say this is my cost. This is um, how much I want to sell it for. How much will I gain? It's a very analytical way of marketing or pricing, which is not recommended to do only this. Cost of ownership method. So this is uh, the value-based method for setting prices. And so this is looking at um, the price of an asset plus the cost over its lifespan. So maybe a house costs this much, but you also have to repair it, um, do just put in a lot more money too. Cumulative um, quantity discount. So this is basically a pricing tactic that offers a discount based on the amount purchased over a specific period of time. So this is usually involving several transactions. And I think of the store ThreadUp, this is like an online thrift store. And basically you can purchase from them and you have like a week or two, and you can just add anything to your cart and it can be the same amount uh, um, for shipping and they may even give you a discount for adding more and the reason they do this is because they ship out your clothes in like two weeks so you have like two weeks to just add whatever you want and get the prices lower and lower which is very smart I've done that once or twice the clothes were cute so a non-cumulative quantity discount is basically where you have to do it all in the same purchase so Bath and Body Works is an example of this like a buy three get one or buy three get three free Bath and Body Works, you can't do a cumulative quantity to discount where you say, oh, I purchased over this past month three items, so give me three free. You have to do it in one purchase. Everyday low pricing. So this is a strategy companies use to emphasize the continual low prices of their goods. This is so interesting. I thought this would be a bad idea because if your goods are always on sale, no one's going to be like, oh, no, sit like we better rush to that sale. But Hobby Lobby does this all the time. Their stuff is always on sale, um, everyday low pricing. And it has this interesting effect on my brain where it's just like, I always feel like I'm getting a deal. So it's not that bad of an idea. It's just I would never guess that it would be a good idea. Like I can go to Hobby Lobby and know I'll get a good deal, or at least what I think is a good deal, um, because it says discounted. <laughs> okay, experience curve effects. So this is the drop in unit cost as accumulated volume um, sold increases. And this is a reason a lot of like um, startup companies do pretty poorly. It's just because the unit cost is so high because um, when you buy from stores or like companies like Alibaba, when you buy in bulk, they give you the quantity discount. And when you aren't um, producing high volume, then you don't get that discount, so the unit cost is too high, so no customers go to you. It's just, it's really hard to break into market because of the experience curve effect. The gray market. So this is a legal way to sell um, goods at prices lower than those intended by the manufacturer. So if there are um, gaming companies where they'll sell you the game for this much, Uh, the gray market would be a legal way to get the game at a cheaper price. High-low pricing. So this is a strategy where prices are regularly set high but lowered for temporary uh, temporarily for sales promotions and so this is basically just having sales like this is just discounts high-low pricing. You turn the dial low then put it back high low high and it's kind of like 
reward system in the customer's brain and they're like they feel like they're getting a deal when they get it when it's on the low horizontal price fixing so this occurs when competitors that produce similar products um, work together to control prices so this takes away power from the consumer and basically says okay all all I don't know um, iPhones are going to be around this price or iPhone's not a good example because it's just Apple. All shoes are going to be, or all running shoes will be around $100. So the consumers don't have any power. And then vertical price fixing. Sorry, you might be wondering, why are there a bunch of sharks? <laughs> um, I did the same kind of shark for this picture because horizontal is like the competing products are um, about on the same level. They're horizon, like their level. But vertical, like up and down, it's like a wide range. So you might have like um, a big shark, like a big company, or a little shark, like a little company. And they do the same things. But this is vertical price fixing is basically when the companies are at like different levels. Yeah. <laughs> value for money? Improvement value. So this is the representation of um, how much more or less consumers are willing to pay for a product um, relative to other comparative wool products. So this is improvement value. Um, I think of every time I go shopping, it's like, okay, so I see this shirt. I'd be willing to pay two more dollars for it at Ross, but I'm not going to drive to Ross. I'll get it here. Stuff like that. Leader pricing. So this is a pricing tactic that attempts to build store traffic by aggressively pricing and advertising a regular purchased item um, above the store's cost to make the item. So you might be thinking, OK, so they're pricing the, the price of a product really low and not making profit. No, actually, they're still making product because their price is above the cost, but it's a lot lower than competition and the other products in their store. Whereas lost leader pricing would be what we just talked about, where they're pricing their product really low. And it's lower than how much it costs them to make it. So they're taking a loss. And you might be wondering, why would any company do that? Well, sometimes if your product is just not selling, taking um, a $5 loss is better than a $10 loss. So you have to set um, the cost of the product below, uh, I mean, the price of the product below the cost just to sell it and not lose as much money. So a markdown. This is a reduction retailers take um, on the initial selling price of the product. Obviously, something's getting marked down. It's getting like discounted. So a lease or a rental. This is a re written agreement under which the owner of an item or property allows its use for a specific period of time in exchange for a fee. So um, this is like renting or leasing an apartment. Okay, penetration pricing strategy. This is uh, when a new product uh, pricing strategy. This is a new product pricing strategy in which the initial price, basically to penetrate into the market, the price is set really low so that companies can get sales and get traffic, and then um, they'll raise the price once they are in the market. Predatory pricing. So predatory pricing is um, a firm's practice of setting prices very, very low to drive out all competition, and then putting the prices back up again. So this is very illeg illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act. Price bundling. So this is basically where you sell one or more items. Um, or like when you sell a bunch of items, you discount all of them because someone's buying more. So I remember when I was selling on Depop, um, someone would like message like, oh, can I bundle? And as a seller, you'd always be like, yes, because you're selling more clothes. <laughs> Normally, you price them like to a point where it's not like a dollar profit. So if it's like each clothing item, it, you're making $10. If someone says, okay, I'll bundle it, and the profit is $15 for two, it's still like more profit. So, But then when you post the picture, I don't know if this is translating, you post the bundle, and then they don't buy it, and then everybody's like, sees the discount you gave and they want that discount too and it's just a mess. But price bundling, putting together items and giving them at a cheaper rate because you're buying them together. Okay, price discrimination. This is the practice of selling the same product to different resellers. So 
I see these tank tops on Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, and at different stores, and it's crazy because they'll sell them for different prices to different sellers, and it's legal, but it is price discrimination because you're giving different treatment to different um, people, different prices to different people. So price skimming. This is a strategy of selling a new product or service at a high price um, that early adopters will want to do or want to buy. So maybe, for example, the seventh Harry Potter, right before it was about to come out, what would have been a smart thing to do, like price skimming, was to be like, okay, I'm going to sell this book for more money. If you want like an early read, I'm sure it would have gotten leaked. And then you can buy it for cheaper. I mean, that's kind of not cool to do to the fans, but it would have made money, I think. Okay, price fixing. This is the practice of colluding with other firms to control prices. So I believe this is legal, but it's still like, eh, you shouldn't do that. I don't know. Actually, maybe it's not legal. Let me look that up real quick. Okay, it's not letting me get out of here, and I don't want to lose the Zoom because we're an hour in. But basically, it's when um, you work with other companies and then control the prices. And so my dad always used to talk about like this in terms of bread. Like, if a bunch of companies just said like, okay, we're gonna make the bread like a hundred dollars, or a bunch of them said we're gonna make it five dollars or twenty dollars, um, and there was already like people buying certain breads they liked, if they all went up to ten dollars or they all went to six dollars, the the markets wouldn't change because they would all be like the same price still. Okay, price lining. This is consumer market pricing tactic um, of establishing a price floor and a price ceiling for an entire line or similar products. So this is basically like saying stay in the line. So we're not going to make mm, this product less than $20, but we're not going to make it more than 30 And then everybody pricing their products somewhere in the middle and then letting quality or customer taste kind of um, determine who will buy it. <clears throat> so pricing strategy this is a long-term approach for setting prices for the firm's products so this is basically the general idea that you're going to have um, plans to maybe at one point of the year for seasonal pricing um, have it be higher or lower based on what season it is or um, around certain um, holidays or events or just in terms of um, it could even be based on like consumer data or it should be it's just a plan and then the tactics is the short-term methods methods to accomplish that plan <laughs> okay a rebate is a consumer discount in which a portion of the purchase price is returned to the buyer in cash <coughs> sorry my throat's getting sore um i love the show it's nathan for you and the rebate episode is where he goes to a gas station, and the it's like 50 cent gas, and so everybody comes for the gas, but he, he says, you get this gas through a rebate, and you have to climb up a mountain and do all this stuff, and then you'll get the cash back, and he pretends like, okay, it will never end, but the rebate box is actually hidden. I highly recommend, I'm, let me get some water. All right, sorry about that. We only have about 20 more slides, so we'll push through slotting allowances so this is uh, money that you have to pay to get your product into a store so you can't just get into Target or like Walmart by saying I, I think this product would sell normally you have to pay a little money first unless there's high demand for your product value based pricing so this is an approach that focuses on the overall value of the product as perceived by consumers this is so fascinating so I heard in one of my classes that in China it only takes about like five dollars to produce an iPhone, but of course you're not going to price it based on the cost-based um, pricing. You're going to do, okay, if people in China perceive the iPhone to be $1,000, um, they will pay for that because that's the perception. Okay, uniform delivered pricing. So this is the um, rate that the shippers charge, and it will be the same rate no matter what. So again, selling on Depop, I did uniform delivery, excuse me, delivered pricing I just did five dollars flat all delivery just because I didn't want to deal with like okay it's a couple cents more to ship it to Colorado or Utah or like 
versus New York. Um, it's just an easy way to say, if you're not shipping anything especially heavy, to say, okay, it's all just going to be the same. Like a uniform. And then zone pricing. This is uh, when the shipper sets different prices depending on the uh, geographic area. Factor 19. Advertising. So I put the term marketing after just so we can remember the difference. So this is like creating and capturing and delivering value. Whereas advertising is the form of communication where you deliver um, the idea that the product is needed. So marketing is the bigger picture than advertising is a way to market and say, okay, you actually need this. Okay, body copy. This is the main text portion of an ad. So the body text. Brand elements, this is characteristics that identify the sponsor of a specific ad. So for this one, we had um, American Red Cross. So characteristics that identify the sponsor. Um, <coughs> this poster, you have this. The, the, um, the text, of course, the imagery, those are brand elements. Cause-related marketing. So um, this is commercial activity in which businesses and charities form partnership to market an image. So let's just say there were, there was like um, a company that did social work, and then maybe Pampers or Cruisers, if they partnered together to like maybe help um, moms in poorer areas and give away free diapers, this would be, or discounted diapers, this would be cause-related marketing. Emotional appeal. So this is an appeal that aims to satisfy customers emotional desires rather than their utilitarian needs. <clears throat> so a great example of this is the Humane Society. They advertise mostly on emotional appeal by being like, oh, look at the dogs, I want to help them. Informational appeal. This is used in promotion to basically <coughs> consumers will make decisions based off factual information and their logic, their brain, more than their heart. Of example is like saying, okay, we have these fries and they're healthier for you, and they give you information, stats, data, etc. Institutional advertisement. So this is a type of advertising that promotes a company, um, unlike like a product. So Humane Society is an institutional advertisement. It's not promoting like um, a collar for dogs. It's promoting the company itself. So lift. This is an additional sale caused by advertising. So it's like I also think of it as like gains. Like how much are you gaining? How much are you lifting from your advertising? Like if you're not gaining anything, there's no point of advertising or marketing in general. The media buy. This represents the actual purchase of airtime or print pages. And so it's like oh, how it, you want your media buy to be lower than your um, sales, you want your sales to be higher. Media mix, this is the combination of media and the frequency of advertising in each medium. So Doritos have commercials, the media mix would be like how much airtime they get, um, when do they do it, like during the Super Bowl, what kind of media do they use. Point of purchase display, so this is a merchandise display located at the point of purchase. So an example of this would be like at a grocery store when you wait in line, the point of purchase would be like, okay, this is right next to the cash register. I'm just going to get it. Puffery. So this is legal, legal exaggerations, um, shop stopping just short of lying to the customer that will exaggerate a product. So huh, he is exaggerating himself. He's doing self puffery, sells two textbooks, calls himself a serial entrepreneur on LinkedIn. There's a lot of puffery, puffery and like resumes too a lot. <sighs> Sweepskates. So this is a form of sales promotion that offers prizes based on a chance drawing of en enters, entries, entrance names. I put a casino picture here because the other night I went to a casino night at my school um, and we entered um, a raffle and I won it. It was it was kind of a sales promotion because we had to like give them money or like casino money and then we got um, to draw. Sweep sweepskates is basically just saying like a raffle, but I won it you guys, I was so happy. Okay.
unique selling position. This is a strategy of differentiating a product by communi communicating its unique attributes. So we are not like other companies, all the other companies. This would not be a unique selling position. You need to have unique stuff about your product. Yes, we're done. Okay. Good luck. Thank you for watching. I love this meme. I just found it, but it wasn't for a term. If we stop buying their products, we won't have to boycott their stores. <laughs> um, I wish you best of luck on the final. Thanks for watching my vids. Um, whoever has stumbled upon this video. Um, bye.